Bless the Lord Jesus. Praise God. I want to greet you in the mighty, the most exalted name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our soon coming King. I thank you tonight for tuning into Bible study one more time. Amen. What a blessing we have been having over the past uh, few weeks looking with Elder Smith at the mind of Christ. But tonight we are going to move to a, another topic. Amen. Just a one day topic. Uh, coming next week, uh, Elder Bailey should be continuing. Praise God, I should be starting a new subject. But for today, we'll be looking at the armor of God, the armor of God. Amen. I think it's an important topic for us to look into. And there are many things that we can learn as Christians as we grow, the scripture says, in grace and in the knowledge of God. There are many things we can learn from the armor of God and we can learn from the book of Ephesians. And tonight, I intend that we will learn something, amen, and not only that, we will apply it to our lives, you know. James gave the practical example, amen, in his epistle of how we should apply scriptures. The Bible says if we go to scripture and then do not apply it to our lives, we are like somebody looking into a mirror or looking into a mirror and then going away and forgetting what manner of man we are. But tonight I pray, God, that we will be hearers of the word and not doers of the word. God bless you. And we're going to jump to the scripture of Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 10 to 12. And we'll put that up on the slides as we go right there in Jesus' name. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He says, Wherefore, verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of God, that he may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, Verse 14 to 17, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praise God. Tonight, we're going to be looking at that particular scripture in Ephesus. But I've always believed that whenever we should look at any scripture or try to dissect a particular scripture, we should do it in light of the whole book. Amen. It's very important that we at least have an understanding of what the book is about, amen, and what was taking place. Praise God. So what we realize is that the epistle of the Ephesians uh, was addressed to the church in Ephesus. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because while I say it's addressed to the church in Ephesus, amen, you have some scholars who would tell you that this is also the, the letter that Paul spoke about in the, in the book of Colossians, to the church of Laodicea. As a matter of fact, in some manuscripts, it's, it's said, amen, that when you look at the original manuscripts, after it says, addressed to the church in Ephesus, there is a big blank. And it is suggested that what normally would take place is that the letter, amen, would have been written to not only the church at Ephesus, but there are a group of churches that normally existed in Asia Minor, Amen. And we see a similar instance where John, who, when he wrote from the Isle of Patmos and he sent his letters, they were sent to the seven churches. Amen. So it's normally a postal route um, where these letters would come across um, through the agency, starting at Ephesus and would have moved along. Amen. So that's a big debate as it relates to who the letter was written to. But it was addressed specifically in our King James Version to the church at Ephesus. Amen. Now, the city of Ephesus really was, a, as it says, a crossroad of civilization and a city of great 
political importance and it was a commercial and it was a religious city all right um a lot of things took place at ephesus it was a, like in that time one of the modern day cities outside of rome ephesus was one of the great pearl in that side of the world all right now one of the things that happened also in ephesus is that they the city had a lot of temples um, and it had a great temple that was dedicated to a, a female goddess called Artemis. And also, she was the fertility god. She's also called Diana, depending on who you're looking at. If you're looking from the Greek side or from the Roman side. Amen. But practically, the city had a temple that was dedicated to Diana. And the city of Ephesus was about six miles from what is called the Aegean Sea. So it was inla inland, six miles from the Aegean Sea. It, meant it was a very popular city. It was a very um, commercial city. It was a very religious city. Praise God. Now, as you can see, um, you will, you'll see that there is a temple that was an example of a temple uh, that was dedicated specifically to Artemis or to Diana. Praise God. And the temple that was built there was considered to be one of the great wonders of the world. It was a beautiful temple. It had uh, magnificent um, columns. It, it had a magnificent artwork on it. Amen. It had the goddess. And, and, and the, the picture that you're seeing there is, is actually a picture of the goddess Artemis. Um, she was, I said before, she was the... The, the, the chief fertile god. She was a god of, of childhood, according to them. She was a goddess of wild animals and hunt and vegetation. As a matter of fact, in, I think it was in um, Ephesus here that at the courtyard they had a very big tree and they believed that people used to come and they want to touch the tree, especially women who wanted to have children would have come and they would touch the tree or eat from the tree, believing that this goddess Artemis would have given them, um, given them some form of, make them be able to become pregnant. No wonder, and they, they, they look for blessings and so on that come from the tree. That is why when God was writing to the church at Ephesus, he said that if you overcome, I will let you eat of the tree of life. Amen. Which is in the, so he was linking um, what was taking place in the modern city of Artemis with what he um, was going to do. So I said there was a temple of Diana, her Roman name, and Artemis was her Greek name. And she was the chief glory of the city of Artemis. Now, the original city of Artemis was actually built about 630 B.C. <laughs> Praise God. But it was burnt down. And when it was burnt down, it was burned down by a man who wanted to have his name known in history. Now, it is said that because of what he did, people specifically did not mention that man's name. Because his aim of burning down the city was to make his name known throughout history. So as time goes on, people would have known that this particular person burnt down the city. All right? And because of, they knew his intention, they deliberately left his name out um, in history. But on the day it was burnt out, was the same night that Alexander the Great um, was born. And it was Alexander the Great who rebuilt the city that we know to be Ephesus, that existed during the time of the apostles, that existed during the time where John wrote about it. And um, it's interesting history for us to know in relation to the very city of Ephesus, all right? And I said before, Artemis was their most famous god. She was the daughter of Zeus and Leto, and she was the twin sister of Apollo, according to Greek mythology. Praise God, but, I mean, this was the famous building, the great wonder of the world, the, the great temple of Diana that was built in honor of this woman Artemis and here we see another picture of the remains of how art of how the temple of Artemis actually looks today uh, praise God now let us move to uh, the history of the church of uh, as it relates to um, Ephesus now the church of Ephesus was planted by the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 19 
And if you can remember, Aquila and Priscilla was also mentioned or ministered at that particular location. Now, if you can look and re refresh yourself of what took place in Acts chapter 19, remember that when Paul went to Ephesus, um, you remember he was here, he met the, the disciples of John, amen. And um, when he met these men, praise God, they, they were baptized unto John's baptism and Paul baptized them and so on and so forth. And he said that when Paul went to Ephesus, the first thing he did for three months, uh, Paul was preaching in the synagogue and he was preaching every day in the synagogue, disputing uh, the things that were being taught, as it were, by the people in the synagogue. And the people got fed up of him and they threw him out of the synagogue. And it was from here that he went to a place that is called the school of one that is called Tyrannus. Amen. And Tyrannus, it is said for three or two and something years, uh, Paul preached to the Jews and the Greek. Amen. The whole gospel message at the school of Tyrannus. Amen. And um, it is said that he preached everywhere and everybody who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord by Paul's message at this school of Tyrannus. So it is you can know that Ephesus was a very prominent church because out of all the places that Paul established, um, history has it to say that Paul spent the most time at Ephesus. It was from Ephesus, brethren, that we, we learned the story of when people were sick and Paul would have um, passed his handkerchief around, praise God, and his aprons and people who had disease and sicknesses would have been healed from evil spirit. Amen. And it was from Ephesus that we learned about the sons of Sceva, amen, who decided that, and these men were, were, were idol worshippers themselves, but they decided that they were going to take on because they see the power, the impact that Paul had by preaching this gospel for two and a half years in the name of Jesus and the power that took place by his preaching. And the sons of Sceva decided that they would have tried to cast out demons also using the name of Jesus. And remember the story that the evil spirits answered them and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Praise God. And, and he said that these men got a good fine beating, praise God, by these devils. Praise God. A lot of things happened in Ephesus. It was at Ephesus that there was a man named Demetrius. Praise God. And this man was a silversmith. And as I said before, uh, the main god in Ephesus was um, Diana. Praise God. And it is said that they, they would build a shrine to, he would build some little shrine gods. I mean, some gods to Diana or to Artemis. And because of Paul's preaching, people stopped buying these gods. As a matter of fact, they threw out the gods at one point and burnt them. And so you know that the, the, the persons who built these, these silversmiths were losing work. Praise God. And they, they set up a big issue in the temple, if you can remember, in Acts chapter 19. And they were very angry at the Apostle Paul. And they, 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 they made a big cry um, saying that great is Diana, great is Artemis of Ephesus. They, they, they started to make a big cry, um, even in other silversmith friends. And it created a big problem, as it were, in the, in the theater Amen. And as a matter of fact, they wanted even to, to beat them. And it was this guy by the name of Gaius, amen, and, 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 and Articus who decided that, look here, you know, make no sense, we cause no more confusion. Amen. Um, if it's not true, it, 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 it practically ain't got to naught, you know. But we'll see where he escaped that type of beating. So the, the history of Ephesus, of the church, that it was established by the Apostle Paul, he spent a lot of years teaching at Ephesus. He spent a lot of, did a lot of miracles and, he, and the very main God in Ephesus was being overthrown. I mean, there was a lot of witchcraft, there was a lot of demonic forces that existed in Ephesus. And Ephesus was a church that at the end of the day, because Paul spent so much time in Ephesus, it was very doctrinally sound. Remember, you know, when, when John wrote to the church at Ephesus, he was quick to say that, look here, you guys, um, don't even you, you try them that say they're apostles and are not and found them wanting. I would show them out. You say you don't even 
listen to the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. You understand? They, they were very sound doctrinally church. And, and, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Because Paul, as I said before, established the church. And after he left, he sent Timothy. And then after Timothy, we had people like Apollos who moved through that particular church. And lastly, the, the Apostle John was at Ephesus. Actually, it was while he was at Ephesus, amen, that they captured him and brought him, as it were, uh, to Patmos, amen, which was practically a prison. So, a lot of great things in terms of the history of the church of Ephesus. And I want us to get this because we want to understand the background behind which Paul wrote uh, the epistle that we must, must put on the whole armor of God. We're still there. But as I said before, we want to, want to understand the whole so that we can take the peace out of it and see the meaning behind what was taking place there. So the church was planted by the Apostle Paul. There are great ministers, teachers that came after the Apostle Paul. Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus. Amen. Um, Apollos passed through Ephesus. Amen. The Apostle John went to Ephesus. As a matter of fact, when Apostle John was shown after his time um, at Patmos, it was in Ephesus, according to history, that he spent his last years where he died a natural death. All right? So the Apostle John um, wrote to Ephesus. A lot of things happened there. Now, the book of Ephesus was written, as we said earlier, to the saints, praise God, um, or into Ephesus, I was written to the saints during Paul's first imprisonment around AD uh, 61 to 63 AD. Now, there's a lot of debate um, around this particular issue, but the truth be told is that um, if you look at the last part of the letter of the book of um, Ephesians, and you look at the last part of the letter of the book of Colossians, and they are very similar in writing, you would realize that the book of Ephesus mentions a man by the name of um, Tachycus. Praise God. Make sure I pronounce his name correct. You're right. So in verse 21, but he also may know my affairs and how I did Tachycus, my beloved brother. And that same person is also mentioned in the book of Colossians. And the, when they do the linking, amen, by deduction, they come to the conclusion, praise God, that Ephesus, praise God, that when he wrote the letter to Ephesus, Amen. He was writing it from his first imprisonment. There's no debate about the book of Colossians. And it was during a similar time when he wrote the, the letter of Ephesians. They are very, very similar. The only difference is that the book of Colossians is much more personal and the book of Ephesians is much more general. But the content is the same. Who delivered the letter is the same. Praise God. So it is debated that it actually came around his first imprisonment uh, in AD 61 to 63. Now the book itself that we are looking at can be broken down into two major sections. And um, brothers and sisters, I want us to get this because Paul wanted us to understand a couple things as it relates to our lives. Firstly, from chapters 1 to 3, Amen. When you look at the book, it deals with our position in Christ. Amen. You know, other books talk about Christ in you, but the book of, of, of Ephesians deals with you in Christ. Amen. It deals with our position in Christ. So from chapters 1 to 3, we look at where, who are we in Christ. And it's important. That is why the book of Ephesians is called one of the pearl books of the New Testament. Because any Christian, when you read that book, you come to the understanding that you are not a normal person in Christ. There are some things that he said about you from chapters 1 to 3 that tells you where you sit. Your position in Christ is a high one. Then he moves on from chapters 4 to 6 to tell you, now that you know your position in Christ, how do you live out of that position. Amen. You understand your role. You understand who you are. And then from understanding who you are, then you move on to say, how do I live uh, from this position in Christ? Praise God. So if we break it down, for example, as we talk about our position in Christ, praise God, we can look at chapter 1. And chapter 1 deals with couple stuff. For example, it talks about we are blessed 
praise God, in heavenly realms or heavenly places with every spiritual blessing. Can I tell somebody something? Once you are in Christ, praise God, God has blessed you with every, every means every, every spiritual blessings. Praise God. In chapter one, we learn as it relates to our position, we are sealed with the promised Holy Ghost. My God. So when you're in Christ, amen, not only that you have every spiritual blessing, but they were also sealed with the promised Holy Ghost. Outside of that, praise God, we have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. So it tells us our position that we are just not normal people, but we are, praise God, we have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Not only that, the Bible says we are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Praise God. So we see uh, we have some very high position as a child of God. Praise God. You are not an ordinary person. Praise God. You are a royal person. You have been chosen in him before the creation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Then Ephesians chapter 1 verse 8. We are blessed with all wisdom and understanding in Christ. So, so we have some high position. We are, we, are, we are blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. We are sealed with the Holy Ghost. We have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are chosen in him before the creation of the world. And we are blessed with all wisdom and understanding. That's your position in Christ. It's not a high position, saints of the Most High God. He moved on to say in chapter 2 that we are God's handiwork, praise God, created in Christ Jesus. And, 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 and I guess when Paul was doing this, Paul wanted the, the, whoever the reader of this letter is, the church to understand that, look here, we are not ordinary people. And then when you understand where you are and you understand your position, then you start living out of that position. You start living based on the fact that you are not a commoner. Praise God. In, it's not like in the, in, in, in the, in the um, army, you might have recruit. I mean, a recruit will act like a recruit. Then you get promotion to a private, then probably to a lance corporal, then to a corporal going up. In other words, when you're in Christ, you're in a high position. Praise God. You're not just a, you're not a foreigner. Hey, praise God. You're not a, um, I forgot the term that they use in relation to um, people who are not in the army. But we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, we are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God and members of his whole soul. In other words, you don't have to feel like you're an outcast. Amen. You are a member of God's household. Praise God. We are built according to Ephesians 2.20, upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Amen. We which are afar off, the scripture says, are now brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. So one time you are afar off, but the position that you now have in Christ is that you are pulled near to him. And the truth be told, all of these things that I'm telling you, amen, would take time because I can do a whole Bible study on chapter 1, a whole Bible study on chapter 2 going forward. But we're just doing an overview as it relates to who we really are, our position, praise God, in Christ Jesus. Last, he says, God raised us up and seat us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. You're not an ordinary person when you're a part of the body of Christ. In chapter 3, it says we as a church are a mystery. And a mystery, brothers and sisters, a mystery is something that was hidden but is now made known. So in Ephesians chapter 3 from verse, and verse 4 and 9, we are a mystery. Praise God. The, the, the Old Testament saints did not know about the church. As a matter of fact, there is a principle that we call the mountain peak of prophecy where the, the prophets saw the peaks, but they did not see the valley. Amen. And one of the things they saw, they saw the Jewish things, but they did not saw the, 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 the church, which was hidden from them. Praise God. So we are a mystery. Amen. And he says we are rooted and established in love. 
Amen. Jesus is love. So when they talk about the church, amen, as a church, we have a position where we are rooted and we are established in love, according to Ephesians 3, 17. So the Bible said, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are here together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So I'm telling somebody tonight that you are not a normal person. You have a high position. So the first section of the book deals with our position in Christ. Amen. Now, the second section of the book is how do I live from this position? Amen. And we see, for example, in chapter 4 that we live through unity. Amen. So a good example of that is found in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 to 3. It says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you should walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. That's Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. And with lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, tell us that out of our position now, we should live as Christians in unity. Amen. Out of our position, praise God, we should, uh, we should walk as Christ would intend us to walk. We have a new walk. Amen. And scriptures tell you again, going further, tell you how we should walk. We should walk not as this world. Because the Bible said, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that he henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Amen. So when we talk about our walk, we are, our walk should not be in the vanity of our mind. The Gentiles, they, 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 they look after everything that, that they see around them. They want to capture everything that is worldly. But as Christians, amen, our walk should be different. Amen. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 to 21, it encourages us, amen, to walk as children of light. So here we are seeing now, it, it is telling us, apart from the fact that we have a position in Christ, according to chapters 1 to 3, it is telling us how we should live out of that position. We should live out of that position in unity. We should live out of that position how we walk. And how we walk should be in Christ, not like the world, but it should be in light, as children of light. Amen. So the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, For he were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Praise God. Ephesians also tell us how we should walk in relation to how we relate to people. Amen. So when we look at Ephesians chapter 5, it deals with the whole issue of how the husband must deal with the wife and how the wife must deal with the husband. It deals with the issue of how the parents must deal with the children and how the children must deal with the parents. It deals with the issue of the masters must deal with slaves and slaves must deal with... So when you look at the book in its whole sumness, amen, apart from how we are positioned in Christ, it tells us how we must live in our position. Then Ephesians chapter 6 says that through this position, we have new strength in Christ. Amen. This is where we want to go. Give us strength in our walk to stand against the wiles of the devil. You give us strength in our walk to stand clothed in the armor of God. Give us strength in our position to stand with all prayer. Praise God. So that's a big overcap. When you look at it progressively, amen, it is broken down into three main sections, in my opinion. One, the three different movements, praise God, of the child of God. We are seated in Christ, which speaks of our identity. We must walk worthy of the calling, talking about our lives in the gospel. And then we must stand firm, in the face of spiritual opposition, which is where I want to take us tonight in relation to the armor of God. Now, I want us to understand that, as I rightly say, the armor of God, amen, Paul was in prison in Rome. He was chained uh, to a Roman guard. It's believed that the guard he was chained to him, so he could not move, amen. 
And it's based on this that he observed how the guards would put their uniform on. It is also said that he took the whole picture, um, not only from the dressing of the Roman guards, but he looked at a picture in Isaiah where Jesus himself was dressed in an armor. But most of the picture that we can clearly say, Paul used the, 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 the type of dressing that the Roman soldier would have. And using that picture, as it were, he moved on to say, this is how we should dress. So he used figurative language, praise God, to, to bring across his message. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the schemes or the trickery of the devil. Amen. So Paul was using figurative language as he went here. Notice he started with finally. Because having addressed the Ephesian church and letting them know who they are, their position in Christ, having addressed the Ephesian church and letting them know how they should live out of that position, he was now coming to a finality in terms of now every child of God is going to face a particular lifestyle, as it were. So he said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And notice he said, be strong in the Lord, because now he's dealing with where our strength really comes from. Our strength is not our own. Amen. Our strength is in the Lord. Praise God. And it works well for us when we hide ourselves in Christ and he become our strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that he may be able to stand against the trickery of the devil. He went on to tell you now who the enemy was. And this is very, very important as we talk about putting on the armor. Because what it's doing is equipping us, as it were, for spiritual warfare. Except for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He say in verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that he may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So our position in Christ, we are seated in Christ, we should walk a particular way, but when it comes down to the enemy, we are to stand Stand, having done all, having put on what God has given you, the whole armor of God, you are supposed to stand. And notice your fight is not against flesh and blood. And that term there in the Greek means your fight is not against humanity. Your fight is not against the boss. Your fight is not against the brother or the sister that has caused you hurt. The fight is not against your mother or your father. It's not against flesh and blood. Amen. And once we as Christians begin to understand the warfare, when we are dressed in our armor, amen, we will begin to fight who the right enemy is. The battle, brothers and sisters, is against Satan and his organized group of demons. And I, and, and I like the fact that I said a while ago, it's organized because they do work in an organized way. And we as children of God need to understand that if we are going to be victorious, we too have to be organized. All right. So the fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers. And we mentioned all of this. So to understand what each thing mean, we must look really beyond the symbolism to the reality of what the scripture was talking about. So while Paul looked at the Roman soldier that he was addressing, praise God, he was using the
picture of his of his day that they can relate to amen but it had a lot of spiritual underlying meanings and the truth is this is what we want to get from studying or looking uh briefly today at the armor of god what exactly are the things that he wants us to get from it first of all we must understand that when the bible says put on the armor of god it is speaking specifically of putting on christ himself everything in the armor represents christ Amen. It's really about him. Amen. And that must be the first thing that comes to our mind when we talk about putting on, don't think about truth and righteousness. It's really in his wholesome self, us putting on Christ, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen. So it's a symbolic description of the Lord himself. So look at Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 and Romans chapter 13 and verse 4. Amen. Those two scriptures say, Finally, my brethren, be strong who? In the Lord and in the power of his might. So when you put on the armor, you are being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And, 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 and we have to pay attention to words when we read scripture so that we can get what the scripture is talking about. Be strong in the Lord. Amen. That means the truth be told, our strength really lies in him and in the power of his might. Amen. Romans chapter 13 verse 14 says, but put ye on who? The Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? When you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the loss thereof. So here, the two scriptures that we look at talk about us putting on Christ. And that's the first thing we need to understand as we look at the armor. You have to put on Christ and you have to put on Christ in its wholesome self. Amen. For you to get a full, uh, the full thing that we need. Amen. From having on Christ in our life. For us to be in Christ. For us to be positioned in Christ. For us to be strengthened in Christ. We have to put on Christ. Now one of the things that Paul noticed is that when the Roman soldiers put on their uniform, praise God, the order in which they put it on was very, very important. Um, and, and I want us to get that. And in the same order in which the Roman soldier would have put on his uniform, is the same order in which Paul highlighted, amen, how we should put on our whole armor of God. So the order in which the armor is given to us or stated even in the scripture is very important put on your belt your law is going about with truth eh? put on the breastplate of righteousness then he wants to say your shoes shed with the preparation of the gospel of peace amen talk about the helmet of salvation and they talk about the sword of the spirit so each of these is the order in which paul actually highlighted to us in the scripture we read how the armor should be placed on but each of these things represented something and is a reason why we should use that particular order let's just look at why first of all he says put on your loins must be girded about with truth amen so if you look at ephesians chapter 6 amen and verse praise god 14 stand there for it says having your loins girded about with truth praise god so the first thing praise god that the scripture talk about in verse 14 ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14 is that our loins must be girded with truth and what that does it protects you from deception that's what truth does truth protects us from deception amen that is why it's important as children of god for us to be in the word and we're going to talk about that a little bit longer as we move into each part of the armor individually but he said first you must put on truth and just take it as it is right now truth protects us against deception deception then he go on to say the breastplate so verse 14 and having on the breastplate of righteousness amen and the righteousness which is the breastplate protects us from unrighteousness amen so there is there is some things that happen some order truth keeps us from deception the breastplate which is righteousness protects us from unrighteousness 
Then he say, let's in verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So the shoes, which is peace, protects us from confusion and can i tell you something there is something that happens when there is no peace there's inner peace you know because it makes us a little confused as it leads to what to do but the scripture declare in isaiah that he will keep us in what perfect peace if our mind is stayed on him praise god then they go on to say praise god take the shield of faith amen and that protects us from unbelief Praise God. So the scripture says in verse 16, above all, and I like that fact, it says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And we're going to talk about that later on. But in general, what we need to know is that faith protects us against unbelief. Amen. And we, we know clearly that Jesus does not work in a setting where there is unbelief. Amen. Then he move on to say, and verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword, the helmet of salvation. So the helmet of salvation is, it protects us from bondage. Praise God. The mind, when you're, where you're captured in your mind, praise God, you're in bondage. You know, uh, you know, one, one, one famous reggae artist said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Amen. It, it, even though it's a reggae song, it has some merit as it relates to the mind. Because it's possible for one to be free, praise God, in the free sense, but they're still in bondage. And because their mind is not where it should be. But the helmet of salvation, I'm going to explain that as we go along, protects us from bondage. And so lastly, the sword of the spirit, amen, which is both... An offensive and a defensive weapon. So say, and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praise God. So the order in which I said a while ago, the order is truth from deception, then righteousness from unright protects us from unrighteousness. So the belt is the truth, which protects us from deception. The breastplate is righteousness, which protects us from unrighteousness. The shoes is peace. Amen. Which protects us from confusion. Praise God. The shield is faith. Which protects us from unbelief. The helmet of salvation. It protects us from bondage. And the sword of the spirit. Amen. Which is both offensive and defensive weapon. Now, let me tell you what happened to the child of God. When these things are removed from their lives. A downward progression of one not protected by the armor of God. Those couple stuff. One, if you do not have truth, you are deceived. Now, deception leads us to unrighteousness. That is why Christ said, Amen, we should, brethren, uh, be careful that you're not deceived because deception would lead us into unrighteous living. Amen. Imagine reading the word and there were many issues, even in the first century church, uh, Gnostic believes that the body was, 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 un, was, imat, was not pure and the spirit was pure and therefore it didn't matter what you did in the body, amen, as long as you do it in the spirit. You see, false doctrine always leads us down a road of unrighteousness, amen, and false doctrine comes through a medium of deception. So deception, which is a lack of truth, leads us into unrighteousness. Now unrighteousness always results in confusion, Amen. So at the moment you are unrighteous, after a while, you become discombobulated. Amen. In your thinking, you become confused. Amen. And that's why a lot of people even end up committing suicide and doing all the crazy things because having done all these unrighteous things, it leaves us in a state of confusion. Confusion ends up results in a state of unbelief. Because now you're confused, you don't know what to believe, you don't know where to go. And eventually, because you're living in a state of unbelief, your final dwelling place is going to be spiritual bondage. Now you understand why Paul had to say, we need to put on the whole armor of God. Because if we reverse this, amen, we realize that truth leads to righteousness. Righteousness leads to us to have a clear mind, peace. Peace leads to faith, which is belief, and belief leads us into having, praise God, as it were, um, protects us from the whole hold of bondage. So, brethren, let us put on the whole 
armor of God, praise God, as we try to ensure that we don't have this downward progression in our lives because we are protected by the armor of God. Now, there is something I did not mention in this downward progression, and that is the offensive weapon. Now, the offensive weapon uh, gives us the ability to fight with purpose instead of uncertainty. So now, apart from the fact that we are defending ourselves, amen, we are now in an offensive move. We are moving with uncertainty. We know that if you have a gun and you, and you fire it, you know it's going to cause harm. If you have a sword and you push it, you know it's going to cause harm. So it allows us to fight with purpose instead of uncertainty. We know that when we use the word of God, amen, it brings some, it brings, uh, as it were, uh, fight on the enemy. It blocks the enemy. The enemy hates the word of God. Amen. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, praise God, chapter 9, praise God, and verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 26, praise God. That scripture practically says, I therefore run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beat the ear. So when you have an offensive weapon, amen, you're going to realize, praise God, that you're able to defend the enemy and we're going to talk about the sword of the spirit later on praise god but the sword of the spirit praise god is the offensive weapon everything that we spoke about earlier is really uh defensive praise god but the sword is a offensive weapon because when we go into war we sure that when we push that sword towards the enemy it's going to create havoc it's going to create problems praise god so some offensive, other offensive weapons that are mentioned in scriptures are like prayer, prayers, and worship. Praise God. Like in 2 Chronicles 20. The sword of the spirit, according to Ephesians 6, 13. Pulling down and casting down, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 to 5. Binding and loosing, according to Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. And, you know, that's debatable, but we'll look at that. The blood of Jesus, according to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, 11, which says we overcome the dragon by the word of our testimony. You talk about your testimony also, Revelation 11, 12, 11. Amen. That same scripture there. And in Mark 16, 17, the name of Jesus Christ. So these are some of the offensive weapons that we have that are also mentioned in scripture. Now, let us jump into each of these armor now and try to get even a better understanding of what these armors do. So the first one that Paul mentioned in his list was the belt of truth or you let your loins be girded about with truth. Now, symbolically, the, the loins represent both a protection of our abdomen and gather up our garments so that we can fight effectively. Amen. At the end of the day, we do not know what we really know about truth is that truth at the end of the day is really unchanging. If it was true yesterday, it is true tomorrow. It's going to be true the other day. And therefore, the word of God is not relative truth. The word of God is what we call absolute truth. It is true forevermore. So truth is unchanging. Truth is eternal. And truth is not relative as stated by the world. In other words, I've heard a lot of people make terms like, this is my truth. This is not necessarily your truth, but this is my truth. That's a relative term. That's not true. Amen. Because relative truth is not really truth. Amen. But we have objective truth, amen, which says that, or absolute truth, sorry, which says that if it's true today, it's going to be true tomorrow. Now, why did Paul tell them to put on this, gird their loins with truth? Let us try to look at what Paul was saying. Now, truth is not a principle, first of all, but truth is a person. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. When you have put on your loins gird about with truth, which protects your, 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 your loins and so on, amen, 
you, what you have done, you have put on truth. Now, what usually happens is that most of the clothes that were worn by people in that time, amen, was roomy. The clothes that they wore were very roomy and it, it tend to hamper movements. Amen. So the only way that people could have prepared themselves for any form of activity that they were going to do, amen, was that they would use that belt to gird their waist. All right? And what it did, it kept the clothes together. In other words, it protect them and it allow for free movement. That's what truth does. Truth allows for free movement. Amen. Jesus is equal to truth. And truth is equal to his word. Amen. It allows for us to operate in a particular way because it actually guides us in terms of how we should move. It give, allows flexible, as it were, movement for the child of God. We are able to move, praise God, freely when we have truth. Praise God. We are able to move freely. The truth of God's word helps us against the father of lies and against deception and we're able to move freely when we have the word of god at our aid now you need to understand something about truth every single other garment or every other part of the armor was hitched to this belt so the belt which is the truth everything else must come from truth righteousness come from truth amen peace comes from truth Amen. Everything else comes from truth. Amen. And once you have truth, amen, you can rest assured that everything else will flow. So praise God. So the first thing that we must have is the belt of truth in our lives. Truth is not a principle, as I said before. It's truly a person. And therefore, when we have truth, we have Jesus. Jesus is equal to truth. And truth is equal to his word. Amen. And the truth of God's word helps us against every single lie that the devil will throw at you. There are some lies that the devil will want to pose at our lives to help us to feel discouraged. Amen. To tell you that you are nobody. To tell you that you are this and you are that. Amen. But we can rest assured that we have the truth of God's word. That I am a son of God. That I am a child of the king. That I am seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That I am positioned in a place in Christ. You must have our belts with truth. The second piece of armor, and, and, and there, I said before, we're just going through this quickly. There, 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 there's so much that can be pulled from it, but we're just going through at least getting a full understanding as children of God, as we armed ourselves in this season. Because I can tell you this much, the enemy is not happy. The enemy is not happy with anything that is taking place in the house of God. And he's going to try his best. But guess what? Paul says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. So the second thing we have to place is the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate, it, it's essential in the sense that it, it protects the very vital part of the body. It protects our heart and it protects our lungs. That's what the Roman soldier used to wear. He wears that breastplate that protects his heart and his lung. Now, every believer cannot withstand the accusations of the devil unless he's living a life of victory over sin. So, what we realize, brethren, is that when you put on the breastplate of righteousness, amen, it gives you, it allows you to live a life above sin. So, the Bible says in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, I live a righteous life. That for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. What it is? It is righteousness. It is peace. And it is joy in the Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. So, what we realize is that the breastplate of righteousness, as I said before, it protects the, it protects the, 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 the essential uh, vital organs of the body. Now, there are two Greek words as it relates to righteousness, that, that, that put on righteousness of God. There, there are two things that come that the scripture is talking about in its Greek sense. One, 
It talks about us being righteous in the sense of positional righteousness. Let me explain what that means. Now, positional righteousness means that we are made righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. So Romans chapter 3, 22 says, Speak about the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. So based on the very fact that you are saved positionally, you are made righteous. Amen. In other words, by faith, you are made righteous because your righteousness now is not, is not of you. It's of Christ. And so positionally, you are placed in a place of righteousness by faith. But the Greek word also actually means enabling righteousness. So apart from the fact that you are positionally righteous, you are enabled to be righteous. So the breastplate gives us the ability to make right decisions and to take right actions every day. And that is why as children of God, we have to ensure that we have our loins girded about with truth and we are, have on the breastplate of righteousness which protects our heart. And it also protects, praise God, our lungs. Now, we cannot become righteous of our own. And let me make, make, make that clear. But the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 that all our righteousness are like filthy rags. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, Paul says, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. Praise God. So our righteousness really is of him. Praise God. And therefore we become righteous within him positionally. And that's very important because there's some stuff that the devil would want to chew at us. Stuff that you have done in the past. Things that you have done in your, li in your life that he would want to throw at you. Want to ensure that your, your heart gets sick. Amen. Ensure that you're worried to death. Amen. But when you have on the breastplate of righteousness, you realize that you are righteous positionally. In the sense that by faith, when I go to God and God wash me and God cleanse me and God makes me right. Amen. I become righteous in Christ. Praise God by having on that breastplate of righteousness. But I'm also enabled to do righteous things. So I can now make righteous decisions going forward. Amen. And I'm not um, cowed down by the guilt of what took place yesterday. Then he moves on to say, uh, we must, our feet must be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Amen. Uh, so every Roman soldier, as it were, had to ensure that they have on the proper footwear. Amen. Um, Josephus described him as so thickly stud with sharp nails. Amen. So as to ensure a good grip. Praise God. So when we talk about our feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, it prepares us, praise God, to have a great foundation. Amen. The gospel provides the foundation for every single thing that we do. Praise God. It's upon the gospel message that we have peace. It's upon the gospel message that we stand firmly. Amen. So when the devil comes to you and say, uh, brother so-and-so, you, 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 you're not going to make it. You're not going to do it. You can rest assured that in the gospel, it says that if I accepted Jesus Christ, amen, I have a sure foundation, I have a sure grip that whatever comes my way, I can make it. I can make it. So it represents the, 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 the protective shoe that was worn by the Roman soldier. Amen. So if you look at it, that word position in terms of preparation actually means two things. One, we are prepared through peace to share the gospel with anyone or at any time on any occasion. So, first of all, our feet is shod with the preparation that we can spread this gospel of peace to every person that we meet at any time, amen, and to anyone on any occasion. But secondly, it speaks to an inner peace during our lives. Peace that gives us victory to the believer when we are discouraged. So John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that ye may have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. When your feet is shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, amen, we can say that we are prepared, one, to declare this message of peace to everybody. 
We have peace with our neighbor. We have peace with, our, with, with everybody we meet to spread this gospel message. But in another sense, it speaks to the fact that we have peace through the gospel message with any storm that we come upon. You know, there's some issues coming in your life. Amen. Some troubles that come, some, some situations that reach you. But out of the blues, you find this inner peace. Your feet is shot, brethren. Because the gospel, the hope that you have in this gospel, praise God, gives us peace. The hope that we have in this gospel gives us, gives us this inner thing that says, look here, and the peace of God would pass all understanding. My God, that means the body can't, it, it, it's hard to understand. How is it that you're going through all these troubles and trials and situations and heartbreak and whatever the case is, but in the midst of all of that, the peace of God, which pass all understanding. That is why we have to be, we have to be clothed in God, you know. The peace of God, which pass all understanding, shall keep what your mind and your heart through Christ Jesus. So the Bible actually says in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, and I love this verse, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. When your feet is shod with the preparation of the gospel and peace, you're, 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 it, it, you tend to be able to give an answer to every man. You have this hope in you. You have this thing in you that says that, look here, at the end of the day, there is a peace. There's a peace for me to declare the gospel to you because I'm 100% I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this is going to give you peace too. But there's a peace in my life because my feet is gripped solid in this, in this gospel message that irrespective of what comes my way. That is why when they were burning Polycarp at the stake, he could have said, look here, I'm not going to give up on my Lord because there's a peace in his mind that says, there's a hope in his mind that says, that, look here, even though I'm going to die now, Amen. This is just temporarily. This is just for a moment. This is light affliction. The, my, my feet is gripped in this gospel message. It is set in it. It is set in the gospel of peace. My God. Brethren, don't let go of your salvation. The salvation message gives you peace that passes all understanding. Then the scripture goes on to talk about the shield of faith. The shield of faith. It says, above all, Taking the shield of faith. Now, the Roman soldier would defend himself against the arrows and the, the spears and the swords uh, of, of, of the enemy by using a shield. The shield of faith to us is a defensive against all the doubt and all the fiery darts of the devil. So if we look at verse up in Isaiah chapter 21 and verse 5, amen, the Bible says, prepare the table. Watch in the watchtower. That's an Old Testament scripture. Eat, drink, arise ye princes, and anoint the shield. And there's a reason why it says anoint the shield. Now, what they usually do is dip the shield, that shield in water, or anything that would diffuse fire. Because what would have happened is that the, 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 the darts that were coming, the front of the dart was dipped in tar, and the tar would have been lit with fire. And they would have fired that arrow towards you. That's why it's called the fiery darts of the enemy. I tell you, Paul was using the same picture of war that took place in that time as a, as, as a measurement of how the Christians should, should live. So the, 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 the shield was normally dipped in oil or it was placed in water. So what we'd have done, it was would diffuse all the, 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 the heat and the fire that was at the front part of the arrow. When it's dipped in water, soaked in water, as it reached the arrow, or it reached the shield, then what would have happened is that it would have been diffused the fire. So apart from the fact that it stopped the arrow, it also removed, as it were, the, the fire from the arrow. All right? So the shield of faith defends us against the fiery darts of the enemy. Praise God. Now, we need to understand, brethren, that we, can, we are able, as it were, to fight the enemy. We are able to fight the enemy by diffusing all the fiery darts of the enemy that he throws towards us through faith. Now, faith, 
Another, another important thing that came to mind as it relates to the shield is how the Roman soldiers used the shield. It is said that when they usually fight, they would stand in a line. And what they would do is not just one person put up his shield, but all the Roman soldiers side by side would have put their shield together. And when they put their shield together, anything that the enemy throws at them would have been diffused. Because guess what? You would always see is the shields going across. So my shield beside your shield, beside that brother's shield, beside that sister's shield, at the end of the day, when the shields are put together, amen, it really quenches the fiery darts of the enemy and it gives protection for each of us as brothers and sisters. Guess what? That can only be done through faith. Because we understand that whatever this brother or sister is going through, my shield placed by your shield together, faith together. That's why this is a unity thing. It's a body thing. Amen. It allows us to defuse the enemy. Now the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6 that without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In other words, when we have faith, if you don't have faith, you really cannot please God. Amen. So we need the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Everything that the enemy will throw at you, every fiery word that the enemy will throw at you, every fiery thought that the enemy will throw at you, through faith. When the enemy says you cannot make it, when the enemy says, look here, you know, see, your life, and the enemy have a way of throwing some stuff. Amen. And he has a way of trying to play with your mind and trying to get you to be, to be uh, in a state where you are di discouraged and depressed. But when you have faith, you are able to quench everything that the enemy will throw at us and have a victorious Christian life. Then he goes on to say, apart from the shield of faith, praise God, the next thing is the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is used to protect the head of the Roman soldier. The helmet of salvation protects our thoughts and our mind. The helmet controls the mind. If a mind is controlled through proper thoughts, amen, it makes us armed against the guilt of the past. In other words, when you understand the power, it's called the helmet of salvation for a reason. When you understand the power of the, the, the salvation that is given to you, it protects you against everything that the enemy, every guilt that the enemy has. You understand that the, 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 you're, the, you have done some stuff. You understand that you have messed up sometimes. You understand that you have done something that you should have been written off. And the enemy would want to accuse you day and night to say, look at this person, look at this person. But when you have full assurance in the salvation, in the blood of Jesus Christ, in the fact that Jesus died on the cross to you, for you, when he tries to sting you, all you need to do is to look at that brass serpent. All you need to do is to ensure that you fix your eyes on the cross. Amen. And when you have that mindset that, look here, God is able to wash me and to make me clean and to make me pure again, it, 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 it protects our mind against every thought that the enemy, every guilt that the enemy would want to throw at us. Can I tell you something, brothers and sisters? One of the things that kill a lot of people is guilt. And I've, I've been talking about this because I realize, I realize that at the end of the day, amen, guilt has a way of working on us and making us feel. A lot of people don't want to do things in the kingdom of God. Something happened 10 years ago, amen. And, and, and even us as saints want to kill the brethren for something that happened 10 years ago. We need to be careful, amen. Let us not be the enemy's tool, amen. Understand that there's a helmet of salvation that is able to control the mind and let the saint know that, look here, every guilt of the past, amen, is able to be dealt with, amen, in the name of Jesus Christ. And we move on. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, Amen, casting down every imagination, Amen, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Praise God. And bringing it into captivity, Amen, every thought, Amen, to the obedience of Christ. When you have the helmet of salvation, you are casting down every imagination, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Everything that the enemy would want to throw at you, you're able to bring it down in Jesus' name. Praise God. Then we move on. Praise God. We 
we move on to the sword of the spirit. Praise God, the sword of the spirit. Now, the sword of the spirit is a, the Bible, we know the truth are clearly telling that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. And the sword of the spirit, the Bible tells us, is our best defense. And it commit the word to your memory and you must commit the word to your heart. Now, let me tell you one of the reasons, one of the things that I've realized about that scripture that jumped out at me. The word, word of God, dear, it comes from a Greek word, rima. Now, no time when we talk about the word, we can talk about the written word. And it's fine. We talk about the word of God. The word of God is the written word. Um... But you can talk about the living word, which is Jesus Christ himself. But the word rima is the spoken word. So, for example, the Bible said the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. It is a rima, spoken word. Now, why I want to highlight this is because the word of God, as used in that situation, is rima. And it speaks to a specific truth that the spirit that is applied, that the spirit applies to a specific situation. Now, let me explain that what I mean. There are certain times where you're going through a particular thing. And Jesus is a good example. When the devil tried to deal with him, bring him down, for every situation that the devil brought against him, he was able to deal with that word, deal with that situation using a specific word to deal with that particular situation. So, when we apply the word of God to our specific situation, we realize that, okay, it's not just having the entire Bible as it were. When we talk about the word of God, in that context, it's talking about the specific word for that specific situation. So the enemy come and try to trouble your mind and say, boy, um, this is going to happen. Then you find a scripture that deals with that particular situation. He said, look here, uh, God is not going to provide. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Amen. He said, look here, you need to be afraid. He said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Uh, try to bring a situation. He said, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give me the desires of my heart. You know, you say, trust in the Lord. Amen. You, you find scriptures that deal specifically with that situation. And when you do it with like that, what you're doing, you're using the sword of the spirit. It's a sharp, it's a very short sword, you know, but it had two edges on it. Amen. An edge that actually helps us as children of God to deal with the enemy as he tries to come and bring us into a situation where, uh, where we, where we feel troubled. But there is a word for every single situation that we go through. God is sending a word through your mouth to the enemy. Sometimes you have to talk aloud. Say, enemy, I will be, you will keep me in perfect peace if my mind is stayed on him. Enemy, he promised that, look here, he's going to come back from you one day. All I need to do is remain faithful to him. He promised me this. He does this. And you declare a rima word over your situation. Amen. Uh, as, as David says, sometimes I have to encourage myself in the Lord. Sometimes you have to find a word. Amen. In the scripture itself that speaks to a situation that you're going through. Amen. Sometimes when you when when, when the enemy wants to come with something, I just say, look, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures. You find a rima word in that particular situation. And that's what the Bible says in Hebrews 4, verse 12. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder, praise God, of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thought and the intent of the heart. Brethren, you have the full armor of God. Now, apart from having the armor, how exactly, and we're closing, how exactly do we stand? So you, you stand putting on the armor of God. But God, Paul, added one extra thing. He did not mention this as a part of the armor. But it's very important for us to have this for the armor to work. So if we look at it, how do we stand? Ephesians chapter 6, 
and verse 18. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for the saints. How do we put on the armor? How do we stand in this situation? We stand all the time in prayer. Prayer, is, as I said before, was not listed as a part of the armor. But armor will never function effectively without prayer. To stand, we take, we take a stand against the enemy. But the stand that we take against the enemy must be a prayerful one. We take a stand against the enemy, we use the word. But we use the word in our prayer life. As children of God, can I tell you something? Everything that I mention here, truth, righteousness, peace, all the way down, is really effective in our lives and becomes truly effective when we have a prayerful life. If you realize that you're not loving the brethren, if you realize that you, you, you can't hold on to truth and you're not living a righteous life, it means that truth, you need to cement everything that you have put on in prayer. Prayer is what seasoned everything. You know, Paul realized this and at the end of his writing and telling the saints to pray, he went on to say, you can read the rest of the letter. He was saying, asking them to pray for him. Even to the point where he said that his speech can go with free utterance. Same Ephesians. Jesus gave us a good example of his very life. He said in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, he said, look here, who in the days of his flesh he said, when we had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. In other words, Jesus' very life was built around strong prayer, was built around strong prayers and supplication. What is going to make your armor and your life effective? What is going to make all those things that you're worrying about and stressing yourself about and the troubles and whatever? Can I tell you something, brethren? Notice something. Whenever we are in prayer, whenever we are in prayer, it helps us to cement all of these things. It helps us to live in truth. It helps us live righteous. It helps us to have peace. It helps us, our minds, to be protected against the wiles of the devil. Praise God. And the word of God in prayer. Imagine you're praying and you're declaring the word, Devil, I shall not die, but live and declare. You're declaring the word in prayer. There is a power that comes with that. I want to close with Ephesians 6.13 one more time. And I'm encouraging every saint of God, amen, as we endeavor to move from level to level in God, that we must take the whole armor of God, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. Paul, in his writing, clearly made it clear to them that, look here, apart from the fact that we are positioned in Christ, in Hebrews, Ephesians chapter 1 to 3, and we must walk, there is going to be an evil day. He never said, if there is going to be an evil day, he said, take on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand in the evil day. In other words, the evil day must come. And we can all experience it. You're going to have temptations. You're going to have trouble. But take the whole armor of God and put on the whole armor of God, season in prayer. So wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that he may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, let us stand. Brethren, I pray God that the lesson that we have learned today is a very simple one. But there are some things that we can pull from it. As I said earlier, the moment we don't have the armor, we can rest assured, praise God, that we will be deceived by the enemy. If we don't have truth, we're going to be deceived. If we're not going to be deceived, we're going to lead to unrighteousness. And righteousness is going to lead to confusion. Confusion is going to lead to unbelief, praise God. And unbelief will eventually lead us into spiritual bondage. I pray God tonight that, you know, as we are saints, grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. That everything that we have learned tonight, as I said before, is not rocket science, is not no deep exegesis or anything like that. But it's enough and it's very simple enough. Paul said, finally, brethren, in other words, let this part, this is very important. He couldn't start the letter without mentioning that. 
We need to put on the whole armor of God. We need to put on Christ so that at the end of the day, we can live a real victorious life. If we don't have on Christ, amen, you're going to live in deception. You're going to live in unrighteousness. You're going to live in confusion. You're going to live a life of unbelief. And you're going to, going to be in spiritual bondage. But each and every child of God is able to gird themselves, to put on what is necessary through prayer as we continue to grow in God. God bless you tonight as we continue to move in Jesus Christ, every saint of God. God bless you. Bow your heads as we pray. Exalted God, we magnify your name. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness. We thank you, Lord, for your word, which is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Hallelujah, Jesus. You say, where we touch, shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to the word of God. You say, you desire truth in the inward part. Help us, Lord Jesus, to hide truth. Let it be girded around our waist. Help us, Lord Jesus, to have on that breastplate of righteousness. Amen. That we might live, first of all, through faith, positionally, in righteousness, but through the breastplate of righteousness, we are enabled to do righteous things. We can make righteous decisions. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be righteous as your words declare. Help us, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, to Jesus to have on our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let it be girded and grounded in the truth of this gospel of peace. Amen. Help us, Lord, that we have on the helmet of salvation, praise God, and the sword of the Spirit and our, sh and our shield of faith, praise God. Help us, Lord Jesus, to put on the whole armor of God, that in the end, God, we might have a victorious life. I pray for every saint. I pray for every saint who listen to this Bible study tonight. I pray for every unsaved person, amen, who will watch this Bible study also, that they too, Lord Jesus, will be able to Equip themselves by becoming saved. They say, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Help them, Lord Jesus, to come to you, to be put in their hearts and to accept you. Continue to bless the house of faith chapel. Continue to bless Jesus to bless Bishop Daly, to bless every minister, every elder, every saint in the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus. We thank you one more time for what you have done. Be blessed. Continue to bless us. As you have said in the book of Ephesians, you bless us with all blessings in heavenly places. We look to you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We call it done right now as we agree together in prayer. In the mighty and exalted name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. By way of announcements, praise God. We have a youth service this Friday. They continue, praise God, with the whole subject of the gifts of the spirit i think sister miriam martin is going to continue on that particular area on sunday sunday school starts at 8 30 amen to 9 30 then church starts at 10 amen let us all try to come out praise god i remember there's the men's retreat september 17th amen if you're interested please contact any member of the men's group department and brother gary gordon uh minister mattox praise god you can contact this person amen and, and tell him you want to be a part of going at that men's fellowship should be a good one but god bless you amen and if we don't if you don't see me again before then we meet in the rapture praise god but we god bless you and i pray god that we'll continue to live a life that is pleasing to god god bless you in jesus mighty name